That's why we do church the way we do church. That's why we do it the way that we do it. Make a joyful noise. Serve with gladness. Come singing. Wow. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. The music team, thank you so much for bringing us into the presence of the Lord. For allowing the Spirit of the Lord to move freely tonight. If you would just turn with me to Luke chapter 2 and we're going to go there in just a moment. I'm going to start with verse 7, Luke chapter 2 and verse 7 and we'll come back to the chapter. So if you want to just put your tab in there so you'll get back to it easy later. It says, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I'd like to speak to you for a few moments tonight and I'll lean on a song that we learned, many of us in nursery class of Sunday school, that just simply said this, away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the bright sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. And we've sung it for years, away in a manger. And we've, we sing that because it was off in a corner or separate from everything else, away in a manger. In another location, in a manger. But I'd like to challenge us tonight with this truth that simply says the way in the manger tonight. I'd like to talk to us for a few moments about a directionless world that absolutely needs the way. The way to go, the way out. The way to turn, the way to take. The way that's in the manger tonight is here in this room. And I believe that God wants to give someone direction as to the way to take in life right here, right now. And so I wonder if you would pray together with me. And ask the Spirit of the Lord to work freely in this place. Like he has been, like he did even in our kids' presentation this morning. It was absolutely wonderful. But God wants to move in a special way in this service, in someone's life. So could we just take the next moments and give them to God? That, that's the greatest gift that some of you could ever give yourself, is to give yourself away just in the next few moments. And watch what God does with a heart that's directed and given to him. Father... We're so very grateful for everybody that's here in this room. God, we have wisdom of years and God's strength of youth combined in this group of people, this congregation that's here. God, we've got some that are very knowledgeable and some that are well-versed. But God, for some people, this is all brand new. And Jesus, I'm asking that you would bring us all to that same plane where you speak to us clearly and give direction freely. Lord, you are the way that we need. You are the way that a world desperately desires. And Father, I pray that you'd make that real to someone tonight. In your precious name, we pray. In Jesus' name, we ask. And everyone said amen. Amen. You may be seated. On the evening of the earth's greatest disaster in Eden, the Lord promised that a son of Eve would someday crush the snake that had led humankind into misery. As time went on, the son of Eve was revealed to be a son of Abraham, son of Judah, son of David. Isaiah saw him as a warrior king, full of the spirit of God, but he also gave him titles that no man could claim for himself, like mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. The prophet Isaiah also glimpsed someone whom he dubbed the servant of the Lord. Like the son of David, he would establish a regime of justice. It would not just be for a Jewish nation. He would also bring the Gentiles the same deliverance from darkness. Yet, somehow, before he attained his glory, he would suffer unspeakably, bearing in his body the full cost of his people's crimes. He would die and yet reign. A paradox yet to be explained to the world. Daniel saw another kingly figure, one like a son of man who would receive dominion over the whole earth forever. One who would receive power and might. But one like a man, you'd have to wonder 
What exactly was Daniel speaking about? He glimpsed the coming of the king who would suffer and reign. And even heard and sensed a timetable that might pinpoint the king's arrival within a decade or so. Micah learned that he would be born in Bethlehem. Zechariah implied that the deliverer would be a priest as well as a king, staining his holiness with the people's corruption in order to cleanse it away. And yet God had told several prophets that he would not share his glory with someone else. He himself would come to deliver his people. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1 makes this statement, Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And then there was also that odd bit in Zechariah about God apparently sending God. Strange. But the fine points of these prophecies were largely lost on a nation shuddering under the weight of Rome. The people, a nation, had long pinned their hopes on the anointed one, the Messiah, the anointed king of David's line who would come to liberate them, the sufferings, the promises to the Gentiles, the inscrutable titles, these perplexities blurred amid the shining vision of someone who would come just to get Israel out of the mess that they were in. And how would he come? A mystery. The prophecy seemed to contradict and paradox amongst themselves. It, it didn't make sense that God would become Man, incredible. But the promise was there, nevertheless. Behold, I will send my messenger. He'll prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. He would come. But how he would come? was the greatest mystery of all. Mary, did you know, is a popular song that we sing right now. Did you know that this little child was who he was promised to be? You know, we did a Christmas float last week. And uh, we, we kind of, is Morgan here? Is Morgan in here right now? No, she's not in here. I was going to bring her up and thank her because she was Mary on the Christmas float. But Mary didn't have any idea about how cold it was going to be. And Mary didn't have any idea about how long the parade would be. And Mary and Joseph, a.k.a. Morgan and Marcus, sat up there diligently waving to people. And the tears began to roll. Mary didn't quite know what she was in for on the Christmas float. And we felt bad for him, felt bad for the kids, and we'll make adjustments if we'd ever do that again. I, I did mention that we won first place for most, for best religious float in the, in the parade, yeah? Give. So Mary, thank you. And team, thank you. As a matter of fact, I'm probably overdue on a bunch of thank yous tonight. I'd like to thank everyone. We had a terrific banquet here on Friday night. Had a lot of help. Could you give everyone a hand for that? <clears throat> Had volunteers here on Thursday and then Friday. Annette and Eric helped head that up and just a great team assisting them. And, and uh, we've just had people working here almost every night of the le week for the last two weeks. And we're very grateful for that. <clears throat> but uh, little Morgan, she, she really, I don't think she knew what, we didn't know what she was in for on that float. But you wonder, Mary, did you really know what you were in for? Did you have any idea? Did you have a clue? Did you, did you, did you understand fully what was happening? Did, and it, it would be an amazing thing. It, it's, I don't think anybody could answer that question with the positive. We would have no idea because humanity was still trying to figure out the way that God was going to do this. How would God go about accomplishing the fact that the almighty God would incarnate himself in flesh and come to humanity? To save us. How does that? How would that happen? How would that happen? And Luke 2 gives us insight. It says, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. 
And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea and to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And prophecy begins to come together. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, more prophetic promise coming to pass, to be taxed with Mary as his spouse, wife being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, it just so happened. That while they were there in Bethlehem, where the promise had been that the Messiah would come, that she, it was accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And then for our text and our message tonight, and laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for him, for him, for them in the inn. In a manger. The king of kings trades the crown and the throne and comes into a manger in a tiny baby body. Awesome. What a promise that is. And what a hope. And Mary had no idea. Mary, you couldn't have known that this was the way in the manger. The way out of hopelessness and the way that the world desperately and absolutely needed in their day was right there in the manger. The way was in the manger. The way out of hopelessness was there, crying and cooing. The way out of barrenness was right there. The way to, to, to fruitfulness in God's kingdom was right there in the manger. The way was in the manger. She couldn't have known, wouldn't have known. I can't, I can't imagine that she would have had any idea, complete idea. Maybe she knew that something miraculous had happened. She knew that she had, had supernatural encounters, that God had spoke with her, and that God had promised her. But wow, right there in front of her, God Almighty. And the world, their world, absolutely needed a way out. The way that our world needs a way out. Our world full of confusion. Our world uncertain of which voice to hear and heed. Our world needs the way in the manger. You say, well, that's pretty arrogant. Absolutely. It's not my arrogance I stand on. I just, I just know. I've seen it work. I've, I, I, we had an opportunity to chat with Brother Parent this past week, and I said, you know, I, it just never ceases to amaze me what happens when God turns a life around. That is the most exciting thing. You can't compare it to anything. There's no financial, anything you could gain. There's no gift that you could get monetarily or physically. There's nothing that compares to seeing God turn a life around. And there is nothing that is like that in the whole world. It's worth every moment that we spend. It's worth every minute. It's worth every dollar just to kind of get together and see what God can do in a heart and a life. When Jesus turns a life around, it's worth it all. When we just let that happen. When someone gets direction for their life, when someone gets turned around and finds the way out of the mess that the world and life has brought to them, when someone finds the way out of hopelessness, when someone finds the way out of the mess that they're living in, the way in a manger. And, and I declare to our church family tonight, a confused world still needs a confident church to speak up loud and clear. We know the way in a manger. We can't back down. We can't just kind of quiet our voice. If there was ever a day when we need to lift our voice loud and clear and say, we know the way. We have an answer. We have hope for you today. It's this day and it's this age. It's in this time and right here and right now that we need to declare with confidence there's the way in a manger. The way out of your hopelessness came to that manger that night. It was the woman at the well. We've all heard of the Good Samaritan. Well, this is the Bad Samaritan. Jesus has just routed the trip through the unlikely place of Samaria. He's devised a divine appointment with this woman, and he breaks the ice by asking her for a drink. Disciples are off to town, and she is completely put off because she can't figure this guy out. And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He said, I've got the answer for you if you're willing to receive it. I've got hope for you if you're willing to, to, to kind of let it in. I've got something I want to give you. And if you knew what I had, you'd be asking for it. You'd be requesting it. 
There's a way out of the mess you're in. You see, the, the life that you've been living has only brought you hurt. It's only brought you pain. It's only, it's only brought you six husbands. And the husband you're with now isn't even your husband. The guy you're with now isn't even your husband. You're in a mess. You don't know where to turn. You tried every turn, every corner. You ran down every back alley. You look for ways in the middle of nowhere. But I'm telling you, I've got the way. The way is in the manger. It's right here talking to you right now. She couldn't completely understand, but she knew that she was on track. Her question is the question of the world to this age. She said, are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well? And drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He was saying, I know that you've trudged down some horrible paths. I know you picked some bad roads. I, I know you made some bad decisions, but if you'll just pause and talk to me for a few minutes tonight, I've got a way out of this mess you're in. There's a way out. And church, the world is saying, is the church really greater than what the world has given us? The world is asking the question, is this better? The world is saying, is what you're preaching about, is it really the answer you're talking about? Or is it just, you know, are you just kind of going through a sermon? Are you going through the motions? Are you just getting together for another group meeting? Or is this really hope? Is this really the church? Is this really a promise that God gave to the world? Is this really the hope of the world? I'd like to know. I, I wish that someone just had a confidence answer to that, to that question this evening. I wish someone would just kind of say, ah, yeah, yeah, it is. Absolutely, this is better. I found it in my own life. I found it in my own home. I found it in my own family. It's better. It turned us around. It gave us hope in the middle of hopelessness. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. But I tell you what, when I found the way in the middle of no way, when I believed the word, it turned my life around. The way, the way out of hopelessness was right there for her. And she is left hanging just for a moment. She's just wondering, what, what should I do in this minute? What do I do in this moment? Do I receive this or do I reject it and go on living the way that I've been living? But I tell you what, when we can get a picture of Jesus in front of people and the promise that he gives there's going to be something that rises up in a heart that says I can't live without that I can't live without that hope I can't go another step without that promise in my life you say that God wants to dwell in me I want it you say that God wants to turn my life around I need it you say that God can wash every sin away that's the that's the thing I've been searching for that's what I've been searching for and I love verse 15 because the woman says to Jesus, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And life forever is transformed from that moment on. Jesus turns her life around. And she's no longer wandering. She's no longer lost. She's no longer looking for something, someone else to fill the void in her life. Because the way in the manger showed up in her life that day and turned her around. As a matter of fact, the word says she leaves her water pot on the well, forgets all about the reason that she came, and runs back to the city and says, come and see a man. He, knew, he told me everything about myself and turned my life around. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to turn lives around. The way is still in the manger tonight. The woman at the well represents the world that we live in. Broken. Hopeless. But this is the way to everlasting life. This is the way. That's what he promised her. He said... If you'll just receive this, if you'll take this, I've got everlasting life for you. Everlasting life. That's hope this evening. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. He said, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
This is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He preached about the way that would happen, the way of hope, the way of promise, the way of the kingdom. He preached about a, a, a promise that was coming. Jesus was on the scene. He's ready to reveal himself, and John is going about preparing the minds and the hearts of the people for the way to take. But it gets to a point in John's life where he doesn't know where to turn or what to do. He's found himself. Jesus has risen in his popularity. Jesus has risen in his ministry. And John, has, as on the same graph that Jesus has rose on, John has declined on. And sometimes that happens in life, even when you're saved. You're thinking, did I really make the right decision? Did I really make the right move? Did I, did I make the right choice? To follow after Christ? Did I choose the right way? Have you ever been there? I mean, let's get real for a minute. Have you ever been there? Moments where you're wondering, did I really make the right decision? I mean, it's safe to say yes. Because John the Baptist, the Bible says, Jesus said, there's none greater than John the Baptist. Raised in the kingdom. He's what he, he, he's a top-shelf guy. He's there. And John the Baptist is the one that sends his disciples to Jesus when he's in jail and Jesus' ministry is going rocketing. And John's in jail. Do the math on that. You make the way for somebody, they rise, and you diminish into nothing. Forgotten, on the sidelines, Set aside, and he says, all right, I've had enough. I'm sending word to Jesus. Sends his disciples to Christ and says, are you the one that should come, or should we look for another? And when the men were come unto him, they said unto Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you, saying, are you he that should come, or look we for another? Now, John knew. He declared him. He'd grown up with him. He knew that the promise of the Messiah was the person of Jesus Christ. He knew. But situations have this way of weighing in on you until you get distorted in what you know. And confusion set in, and discouragement, and doubt moves in. And that's pretty treacherous territory to walk on. And it's in moments like that when you need to get a hold. You, you know, it, it's safe to talk to God about the, in those times. It's safe to say, God, is this really the right thing? Is, and God will send you word. God will send you promise. God, God, will, God will let you know that you, you haven't made the wrong move. You haven't made the wrong decision. That you, you picked the right way. But John is doubting. Jesus, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Every, every indicator to me right now seems to be saying, no way. I was the one that made the way for you, but now it seems like there's no way for me out of this mess that I'm in. And Jesus' response is actually one of action. He begins to cure people of infirmities and plagues and cast out evil spirits. And it says, unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Verse 22, and Jesus answering said unto them, go your way and tell John what things you have heard and seen. How the blind see, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he should, who ever shall not be offended in me. Go tell John, I'm the way in the manger. Go tell John he's not wrong. John, you're not wrong. This is still the right way. This is still the right decision. This is, we're tracking. This is God's plan. This is God's purpose. It's, it's working out the way that I planned it to work. It's part of a grand plan. The way in the manger is still the right way. And in moments like that, we need the confidence and the assurance of the word of God that comes into our lives to let us know. When you're in doubt, get a hold of God's word. 
when you're not sure what to do, get a hold of God's word. Start seeking. God, I need an answer. God, I, I, I need you to speak to me. I, 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 need to, I need to involve myself in your word. I've got to get it internalized. I've got to ingest it. I've got to let it become a part of me so that it begins to address the questions that are in my mind right now. I need the way out of the mess that I'm in right now. And that happens through the word of God. Probably now would be the right time to put a commercial in for the Bibles we're selling for New Year. We want to do that together as a church family. The one-year Bible, one for kids, and there's one for adults. We want to do it together with families. We want to do it together as a church family. It's going to be a lot of fun. Pick one up. But the Word of God has that way to work in our lives. It was the Apostle John that wrote in the opening chapter of his gospel, and I'm not going to be a long time tonight. John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. If you want the way in the manger to become real in your life, let the word of God become real in your life. Because John 1.14 says, The word was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. And the way... In the manger that night. You know, I thought about this and the inn was full. Everyone say the inn was full. Look at your neighbor. Say the inn was full. <clears throat> you ever been traveling unprepared and not made reservations at a hotel and the inn was full? I think Kathy and I were there maybe one time looking for a room and still driving. No room in the inn. You've been there. The inn was full. And I, I'm concerned because the people that I talk with and the people that I meet, we fill our lives so full of stuff. We fill our lives so full of entertainment. And we fill our lives so full of activity and action. And we fill our lives to overflowing until there is so little room for God. We fill our lives in conversations, and we fill our lives with activity. And I'm not saying that leisure time is bad. We need that. I'm not saying going fishing is bad. Jesus did that. See how, see how I worked my sport in there? But I'm concerned because we feel life full. And I think sometimes when God wants to reveal the way in our lives, there's no room in the end. There's no room for him to work. There's no room for him to reveal himself. We don't give him a chance to reveal his power and his purpose, and God steps into pe people whose lives are empty and hope. Can I just tell you tonight, if you came and you don't have anything, you don't have a clue what to do, can I just say that God, that's the perfect opportunity for him to just land in your life and do something miraculous? Can I just let you know that that's the place that God is looking for, an empty vessel? You look at how God works all through Scripture. If you, if you, if you start with the beginning of the Bible, the earth was formed without void, and the Spirit of the Lord, where did God choose to move? He picked some place that was empty and barren with nothing left, brokenness, barrenness. God said, that's where I'm going to work. And the Spirit of the Lord moves, and this is the world we get because God worked in emptiness and barrenness. And that's what God is looking for. He's looking for a life that's got nothing left to lose but a chance. He's looking for a life that's got nothing where, nowhere else to turn. It's got nothing left to lean on. You've got, you've exhausted all possibilities and any other way that you could take and gust it. That's the life that I want to land in. That's the life that I want to work in. That's the manger God chooses to reveal his life to you. The way in the manger. You see, the scripture said, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. We can come back to the music tonight. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace 
and truth. Thank God. It was full of grace and truth. I had a chance to speak with our Bible school dorm guys on Thursday night. I went down past my bedtime to start the sermon. I said, what time do you guys start your, they invited me down to, to speak at their devotions. So what time do you guys start? 10.30. I'm like, Kathy said, are you even going to be awake at 10.30? <laughs> Notice how I did that when she wasn't in the pew. I talked to the guys. I said, you know, Psalms 85, there's a scripture that speaks about mercy and truth coming together. I said, truth is this thing that condemns us. Because truth is, we're all sinners. Truth is, we're all failures. Truth is, we're cheaters and liars. That's truth. You want the truth? And the truth condemns us. The truth indicts us. Guilty as charged. That's the truth. That's what the truth says. But the Bible says, we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten, full of what? Grace and truth. And in the same measure that God knew that we would need grace, he brought it along with truth. And the full in couldn't contain the fullness that God wanted to bring. He wanted to bring a life full of grace and truth. The in that was full of itself, full of activity, full of ambition, full of purpose that the world would offer. Didn't have room for what God wanted to do. And God said, I need some life that's empty. I need a life that's hopeless. I need, I need somewhere to work where there isn't anything going on. It's just kind of, it's just something nobody would expect. That's the location I need to do my work. And God said, if, it's, if the inn is full, you can't even kind of push people aside enough because what I'm bringing to the world is too big to fit in a tiny little compartment. It's too great. It's full of grace and truth. This way, the way was full of grace and truth. It was full of truth that would bring condemnation. But God said, I'm not just bringing truth. I want truth to convict and I want truth to reveal our heart and the rottenness and the sin that we have in our lives but that's not where we're going to stop church we're going to bring some grace along with it and the truth that would condemn gets counterbalanced by great grace God came full of grace and truth just let that settle in for a minute I need that kind of grace. We need that kind of grace. You need that kind of grace. You need grace that's sufficient. You need amazing grace like the old songwriter wrote about. That's what we needed. Because truth was, we didn't have any hope outside of the way in the manger. We didn't have any hope. But when he came, there was this way that came because truth that would condemn us was now balanced by grace. And God said, I want to turn your life around. I want to bring you life everlasting. I want to bring you hope. In the middle of hopelessness, I want to turn this whole thing around. There is the way in the manger. Don't forget, there's a way out of this mess. And God just working the way that he works. Quietly, unassumingly, unexpectedly comes to humanity and brings the Savior full of grace and truth. And tonight God is still saying the same thing. Would you stand together with me? He's saying, give me someone that's empty. Give me somebody that doesn't already have the map drawn of what they're going to do. Someone that's saying, I don't know the way out of this mess right now. Somebody looking for the way in the manger tonight. Find me something that needs to be filled because that's where I do my best work. Find me something that's empty because I want to put something overflowing on the inside. I haven't come to condemn the world, but I've come to save it. A life not full from daily waking moments until daily last minutes of activity and action and voices. Give me 
somebody that's empty and barren and hopeless. And that's where I do my greatest work. There's a way out of that kind of life. I don't want to be the in. I don't want my life to be so full that the sign on the outside says, sorry, no vacancy. God, no room for you to move here. No opportunity. Just living my life the way that I want to. But God wants to bring somebody the way in the manger. You see, the way in the manger is to receive Him. The way in the manger is to allow Him to reveal His power, revelation, to reveal who He is to us more than a story, a reality that God can turn lives around. The Savior. John 14, verse 1 through 6, and this is the last portion of Scripture that I have tonight. Jesus speaking says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know. And then he says this, and the way, ye know. And doubting Thomas says to him, he says, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? But Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said, Thomas, don't miss the moment of opportunity that you have. Because you're looking for the way. And it's right here in front of you right now. And the same statement echoes down through time to this service right here and right now. And Jesus is speaking way louder than Pastor Jack tonight. And he's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you be careful and if you just quiet all those other voices right now, if you just kind of take a moment and forget about the calendar and forget about tomorrow and the week that lies ahead, and you just kind of listen, there's a still small voice that's saying, I am the way, the truth the way in the manger is in this room tonight to deliver, to set free and turn us around could you bow your head with me, we're going to invite you to come to the altar area in just a moment can I just kind of explain for a moment what happens in the altar area, it's not just for church family, that's exactly the opposite actually it's for all of us I want to make a commitment to God that we're going to heed the word, integrate it in our lives, to hear his voice speaking to us clearly. The word becomes flesh in our lives. We get to live it out. We get to walk it out. We get to become the promise that God said we could become if we let it in. Could you pray together with me, Jesus? In just a moment, we're going to invite everybody come to the front of this room and commit that we're going to hear and heed your voice. And God, in a world that's so confused, God, voices that we hear and listen to, so many different people, so many different voices, declaring promises that can't be kept, declaring things that can't be followed through on. But Lord, your word there is nothing greater. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word, not going to fail. God, it's going to complete itself. And Lord, what happens is if we let that into our lives, it takes on life. God, we get to live life abundantly. We get to live everlasting life like you promised that woman at the well. So someone that's confused tonight, someone that doesn't have the answer right now, right here, Jesus, I pray that they would find the way that you're presenting tonight, the way out of hopelessness. God, the way of uncertainty, confusion, God, that you're here tonight and you want to reveal yourself. And as we yield to you, 
God, you fill us, you complete us, and you work in us. God, do that hearts and lives in Jesus' name. We pray tonight. Amen. I'm asking that you come together. Find someone and invite them to the altar with you tonight, if you would, because we just need to commit. We need to commit to God that we're going to follow the way that he's prepared for us. We're going to follow the way, hope that he has for us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The parents, you found some stripes.